Welcome to our workshop today, Bridging Generation Gaps in the Classroom. I'm your presenter. My name is Amanda Smothers. I am the Teaching and Learning Coordinator. I work in the Faculty Development and Instructional Design Center. I earned my PhD in English from NIU in 2016, and I've been teaching college English for about 12 years. I teach a combination of face-to-face, -face, hybrid, and online courses, particularly at community colleges. So teaching in community colleges, I do teach students with a wide range of ages and experiences, uh, particularly in my online evening face-to-face -face classes. So what I want you to do is uh, I want to get to know you a little bit too. So in the text chat, tell us your department or your division, your role, and explain what you hope to get out of this workshop. Uh, if you didn't enter your name when you logged in, I don't think that's an issue. I looked at the list and it seemed like everybody was uh, putting their names down, but make sure to mention who you are as well. And I will share that with everybody as they start rolling in. Looks like some people are typing. Dawn teaches Spanish and word languages. Um, she thinks this topic is interesting, great. Bill is in music. He wants to find out about the views of different generations. Andrea is an instructor and PhD student with the Department of Geography here. Melissa is a GA in sociology and she wants to understand how to help and relate to the wide variety of generations in sociology classes. Uh, Miliana, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, is an assistant professor in the School of Allied Health and Communicative Disorders, and she's interested in generational views in the health system. Cassandra is a graduate teaching assistant in CAMS, <clears throat> and uh, she teaches speech. She's fascinated by the topic. Uh, Natalie's in SEED, is faculty, is excited to learn. Mindy um, is not on IU. She's an assistant professor of biology and their college is planning to launch online courses in the fall and trying to learn things to be successful with that. They have a diverse student body. The average student age this year is 28 for them. Andrea teaches world regional geography. She's seen more and more students in her classes who are older than the quote unquote traditional undergrad student. Yasmin is a TA teaching in ETT and ETRA. Yunju is an assistant professor in public administration, teaching performance management. <clears throat> Rake is doing a PhD in ETRA, teaching online courses, and there are a lot, a lot of people here, which is very exciting. Um, Han is a graduate teaching assistant in ETRA, Hunter, research assistant in sociology, Shaodan uh, is an assistant professor in counseling and higher education. Jamie, grad assistant for sociology. Um, so I'm really excited that there's so many different experiences and, and different perspectives here today. Uh, so we'll get started talking about generational differences. Uh, so our topics today uh, include relating to students across generations. Um, we might see different student populations in undergraduate versus graduate formats of classes, um, and we might be teaching more and more mixed generation classes. Um, so teaching classes that include a wide range of students in multiple generations provides unique opportunities and challenges for instructors and students. So in this workshop, we're going to be learning some techniques for developing teaching strategies to engage those students from different age groups and for building connections among students of all ages. Our workshop goals after this workshop, hopefully you'll know more about generational differences, um, also specifically about NIU student demographics and data. I'm going to share some of that information with you today, and also teaching strategies to address generational differences. 
I have a few just discussion guidelines today. Um, we want to focus on discussing what each generation of students brings into the classroom from their historical context to which technologies were developed as they were coming of age. We also want to discuss how to manage a classroom in which we have students with a wide range of ages and experiences. Um, and so to be productive, we want to focus on solutions for motivating and engaging students. And we want to avoid generalizing about all students and to avoid complaining about students. So in other words, this isn't just going to be a great session. But we also want to talk about what it means to define a generation. So when we talk about generations, there are generally some guidelines for what constitutes a generation. First, what defines a generation is their location in history, including what noteworthy historical events they've lived through. And these can be world events, economic events, social events, uh, national, local, and so on. Something else that defines a generation are the technological advancements that occurred, occurred during their lifetimes. For instance, the inception and evolution of the internet, um, or the progression from landline phones to mobile phones to smartphones. Additionally, and probably most importantly, a defining feature of whether someone belongs to a generation is whether they perceive generational membership. So in other words, does a person identify with that generation? What are an individual's personal experiences as compared to those generational stereotypes? What about generational cuspers, those that are born on the cusp of two generations who may share commonalities and have differences with both generations, and so they might not feel a part of either. So that leads us into our next topic, which is generational generalities. In other words, some stereotypes about the past four generations. So I want to just have a little bit of discussion to talk about what your preconceptions are. Um, so let's discuss some of the generalizations about different generations that you have heard, either in the media, in conversations, on social media. Um, so what, do you, what are your perceptions of each of these generations? So baby boomers, Generation X, Millennials, Generation Z, which is our youngest generation now. Uh, just type your answers in the chat box on the right side of your screen if you want to share. Um, and to be clear, you don't have to buy into or ascribe to these general generalizations or stereotypes. These are just things that people tend to say about members of generation. So I'll give you a minute to, um, to share some maybe preconceptions that either you've heard or that you hold about generations, um, and then I will share them out loud. Um, Cassandra says a stereotype is that millennial students are academically entitled. Um, Dawn says that one is Gen X um, is not good with technology. Yasmin's taking ETT 552 and this is the topic of this week so she's heard them all. Um, that boomers are disgusted with millennials, Mindy says. Um, that boomers are greedy pigs, Bill says. Um, that younger generations have more effective use of technology, that boomers are less open to changes, um, that they look down upon younger generations, um, that boomers are uh, adverse to technology, that they might be racist, they might hate millennials. Um, Melissa says there's not much about Gen X, maybe. Some, maybe that um, moniker that they sometimes have in the media, the lost generation, <laughs> kind of getting lost between boomers and millennials. Um, Melissa, millennials ruin everything, including napkins. That younger generations are lazy and don't really know what hard work is. Uh, that Generation Z are dumb with the Tide Pods. Uh, Mindy says Gen X is awesome. Any others that we've heard? Just take a few more seconds. <laughs> All right, so on the next slide, we're going to see a timeline of generations and maybe a sampling of some common uh, generalizations about each. Um, Mindy also says Generation Z gets bored very easily, so we'll, we'll, we'll address some of these generalizations on the next slide. So here's just a basic timeline. Um, and for the purposes of this workshop, I've used Pew Research for generation birth years. Uh, they vary depending on which source you're looking at, but I just decided to use Pew Research. Um, so we've got, uh, starting here at the silent generation, which we're not really going to talk about too much, 1928 to 1945, um, some generalizations about them, loyal, competent, institutional, play it safe, thrifty, rule followers, um, 
baby boomers, goal-oriented, work-focused, successful. They've got that bootstraps mentality. Um, Generation X, independent, pragmatic, cynical, distrustful of authority. Uh, millennials, the um, stereotypes of them, they're protected, expressive, socially conscious, diverse, spend too much on avocado toast. Um, just put that one in there as a, a funny one. Um, but it actually was one that, that came up in the media a couple of years ago. Um, and then Gen Z, our newest generation, um, technically not the newest generation because they the birth year ends in 2012, but um, our gen newest generation of students, even more diverse, uh, tech savvy, screen dependent, and also socially conscious. So a little bit of similarity with some of the millennial and Gen Z. Um, so I want to have a, a little bit of a discussion as we look over this chart. So first, looking at these generalizations, which do you identify with for your generation? Which do you not identify with that fall under your generation category? So think about these um, these generalizations, these stereotypes, and think about your own generation. What do you identify with? What don't you identify with? So uh, some classic Gen Xs, identify with that. Okay, Shelly says she's not necessarily distrustful of authority even though she is Gen X. Yvonne says she does not identify. Cassandra is a millennial and allergic to avocado, so buying that avocado toast. Um, Yunju is uh, middle of ex millennial, so a cusper there. Um, Melissa is a m millennial and hates avocado toast. Jamie was born a millennial but relates more to Gen Z. Andrea is a cusper, identifies more with Gen X than Millennial. Uh, Dawn, Gen X, cynical. And Shane, also, cynicism and independence of Gen X. Yvonne says she doesn't fit into boxes, she takes aspects from each category. Yes, yes, very good point, um, Xiaodan. Uh, they just wanted to bring up that this is more rooted in U.S. or Western culture, so it doesn't necessarily apply to people from different backgrounds. That is a very good point. So that's a, a whole other discussion, too, is, is cultural difference. So that might be a good topic for um, another workshop to expand on that idea. Miliana says she doesn't. Uh, identify with any of millennial characteristics, probably because um, they were born outside of the U.S. Okay, great. So all of this is kind of leading into my next question. Why do you think people try to generalize the characteristics and values of each generation? What do you think is the purpose of that? What do you think is the purpose of trying to generalize or fit people into boxes with these generation stereotypes? Any thoughts on that? For understanding, consumerism to design products, good point. Easier to make quick assumptions. Understanding demand, solidarity with similar people and distance from others. Marketing, audience targeting. Uh, convenient explanations. Okay, great. Um, so let's talk about how people might, and we've got some, some participants who said that they don't really feel either generation. They might have been born on the cusp and they might identify with one generation more than another, or they might have been born in one generation but identify with a different um, 
So let's talk about younger versus older members of a single generation. Um, because a generation can span a decade and a half or up to two decades almost, there are some pretty wide age gaps between the earliest members of a generation and then the later members. And this can mean that they have different experiences of the world, particularly with the two recent generations I'll just um, go over, millennials and Gen Z, there can be some pretty significant differences between members of the same generation because of the rapid advancements in technology that have occurred over the past few decades. So looking at Gen Z, the younger members of the group have never not had smartphones, the internet, and social media. They've always grown up with those things. Older members of Gen Z, however, were the first connected kids. So they were in elementary school when the first smartphone was introduced in 2006 and when social media was really taking off with Facebook in 2005 when it became um, publicly available after it had started at, at Harvard. Um, so looking back a little bit further at millennials, we see even more stark differences between older and younger members. Younger millennials are digital natives. They grew up using cell phones. They were in middle school and Facebook opened up to the public and the first iPhone was released um, in 2006. Older millennials, on the other hand, were the last to grow up offline. They were graduating from college when Facebook and smartphones came out. They used dial-up internet when they were younger. They didn't grow up with any social media. Um, few of them had cell phones in high school and college, and none had them in middle school. Uh, and they remember using landline phones, pay phones, having to memorize phone numbers. Um, there are also cultural differences between older and younger members uh, of a generation, so cultural things that they might um, experience differently. So for example, younger baby boomers tended to be um, more conservative than older baby boomers rebelling against the liberality of social movements of the 1960s, for example. Um, but of course, you can't put everybody into uh, the same box. Um, while there are a lot of generalizations made about each generation, they should be taken with a grain of salt. Not everyone in a generation will identify with those characteristics as we've seen um, in our own conversation, and stereotypes can actually be damaging. So next we're going to discuss why those generalizations can be harmful and why they might, might not uh, be as useful as we think they might be. So generations are often generalized for, as someone mentioned, a couple people mentioned, for marketing purposes. If you do a Google search of each generation, most of the results are going to involve business marketing websites that aim to draw conclusions about a particular generation in order to decide how best to sell a product or service to members of that generation. A danger with these stereotypes is that they often lead to gaslighting. Sometimes that might be the purpose behind them, especially if uh, you know an older generation or a, one generation is is stereotyping a, a younger generation. Um, older generations, and this is just a generalization, but they tend to complain about newer generations by creating stereotypes that paint them in a negative light while maintaining the superiority of their generation or older generations. So for example, we have seen, we saw this in our discussion, who hasn't heard about millennial entit entitlement? Um, so a uh, media article uh, in Quartz addresses the, this myth of millennial entitlement and notes that uh, terms like preference and choice dominate media coverage of millennials, but if anything holds that tenuously defined generation together, it's a lack of options. Um, they say that Americans who live much of their adult lives in the aftermath of the Great Recession, for example, have lower incomes, they have less mobility, and they have greater financial dependence on older relatives than any other generation in modern history. Um, and this author notes that many millennials don't have a lot of choice. Um, they're reacting to lost opportunity uh, as a result of that uh, economic downturn. And they also go on to address what I mentioned previously about generational scapegoating and gaslighting. Um, the author of this article is Sarah Kenzier, and she writes that, quote, for most Americans under 40, life since 2008 has been a struggle to survive, but it's worth noting that plenty of older Americans share the same struggles as their younger peers. Many older people laid off in the recession were unable to retain good jobs or regain good jobs. There are plenty of older people with few retirement savings, with finances drained from paying for both elderly parents and jobless children, and we need to acknowledge the way our struggles are intertwined instead of allowing the media to stoke manufactured class and generational resentment. So she's talking about uh, bridging that gap between generations and maybe not trying to scape scapegoat each other um, or criticize each other, but recognizing the similarities between um, our experiences. Um, and I think that the most important thing to remember about generational 
differences um, and generalities is that they're often based on the experiences of privileged groups as well. So that's one other thing that we want um, to talk about. So discussing technology, for example, may leave out the experiences of lower income individuals of that generation who may not have had access to home internet access or may not have owned a personal computer. Um, similarly, when we're discussing historical events that may have affected a generation, someone who is struggling to make ends meet may have been affected differently or even not at all uh, by a seemingly significant political event, for example, like the Clinton impeachment um, of the 90s, than somebody with a higher income who may have had the luxury of time and resources to follow that event more closely. Um, so in the end, we as educators should approach teaching our students uh, of any given generation in the same way that we approach teaching overall, by using teaching best practices, by meeting students where they are, by helping students progress to where they need to be, and by adapting to changes in technology to provide students with the most enriching learning experience possible. Students are not a homogenous group, um, and they become even less so as time goes on and more um, quote-unquote non-traditional students join their ranks. But regardless of whether they fall into the same generation category, our goal is to figure out what they need from us in terms of learning experiences and support so that they can succeed in college and beyond. And our job is not to prejudge our students based on stereotypes about their quote-unquote generation. So let's talk about traditional age students. So there are some common complaints about traditional age students. Um, and I'm not trying to perpetuate these complaints, but just kind of open this up for a discussion and give you some uh, questions to think about, some rhetorical questions maybe. Um, so how many of us have heard and said these common complaints about college students? They don't spend enough time on their schoolwork. They don't try to, or they try to get by with minimal effort. They don't read for homework. They don't participate in class discussions. They think they deserve high grades. My questions to get us thinking are how long have we been complaining about these same things? And is this generational or is this just traditional age college students in general that we're complaining about? And finally, what is our responsibility in creating self-regulated or engaged learners? So for example, if we feel that students don't participate in discussions, what are we doing to change our approach so that we do engage students and encourage them to participate? Or if students aren't reading for homework, what can we do to ensure that they do read? How do we change our approach? Often our complaints about our traditional age students supposed generational defects are recycled refrains from educators of years past, complaints about our generations when we were college students even. So for example, I'll give us a, a way back example, but way back in the 14th century, one complaint of students was that, quote, they attend classes but make no effort to learn anything. The expense money which they have from their parents or churches, they spend in taverns, conviviality, games, and other super, uh, superfluities. And so they return home empty without knowledge, conscience, or money. So for centuries, we've had similar complaints about our students. So what does this all mean for our students? Who are our students today? So let's take a look at who is coming to NIU today. Statistically, there are fewer college students today than our traditional, um, or fewer college students today are traditional. Traditional students have recently graduated from high school or unmarried and childless and have no min or minimal employment, or at least the privileged ones are able to have no or minimal employment. Um, more students are starting college later in life returning and or balancing more obligations. So these, what we would uh, call non-traditional students, can be years removed from their last education. They might be taking care of aging parents. They might have spouses and children. And they may have jobs or careers that they need to balance with their studies. At NIU specifically, adult learners com uh, comprise 31.59% of all students on campus, so that's almost a third, according to uh, fall 2018 10th day enrollments. So this is behind, actually, the national statistic of 38.5% of students, 25 and older, enrolled in degree-granting post-secondary institutions in that same year. Um, most non-traditional or, or adult students age 25 and older at NIU enroll as graduate students. Uh, law students, and undergraduate transfer students. 76.95% of graduate students are 25 and older. Um, 50, a little over 58% of law students are. And 16.5% of undergraduate students are 25 and older. Um, but the vast majority of new freshmen are between the ages of 17 and 24. 
Most undergraduate adult learners enroll at NIU as transfer students. Uh, new transfers, 18, a little over 18% of new transfer students were 25 and older, um, and about a third of them were at least 23 years old. One interesting national statistic also highlights the appeal of distance learning among college students, particularly adult learners. Um, Overall, about half of undergraduate and graduate college students at degree awarding institutions um, were taking at least one online course. So that's also something that we need um, to adjust to as well as the, the increased demand for online coursework, particularly among adult learners. So the number of adult learners at NIU across levels and programs indicates the need for strategies to support adult learners in all areas. Um, so next we're gonna discuss briefly some details about each of the past four generations, beginning with the most recent, Gen Z, and moving our way backward in time. We'll look at the age range of each generation based on Pew Research, as I mentioned before, and some historical and technological context for each generation. And then we're gonna discuss, um, in general, how best to teach in a multi-generational classroom. Generation Z were born roughly between 1997 and 2012. Um, a majority of NIU undergraduate students are now Generation Z, the traditional age students. Um, Gen Z are the most racially and ethnically diverse generation we have taught thus far. They're more likely to enroll in college, less likely to be in the labor force, which might have something to do with the Great Recession rather than an unwillingness to take a job. And they're more likely to have a parent with a college degree than prior generations as well. While Generation Z are actually less likely to be immigrants than millennials as of last year, um, most recent data, that is expected to change. Um, it's expected to increase the diversity, racial and ethnic diversity, in future years as new immigrants join their numbers. Um, and they're actually projected to become majority non-white in 2026 when they're aged 14 to 29, according to Census Bureau proje uh, projections. So let's take a look at what's unique about generation experience in historical context and with technology. The older third of Gen Z students were in preschool and kindergarten when 9-11 happened. The other two thirds were not yet born. Thus, for most of these students, 9-11 is a historical event. Um, similarly, the oldest were toddlers when the Columbine shooting happened, and therefore all Gen Z students have grown up with shooter drills in schools. Along these lines, safety is a major concern for Generation Z students. School shootings, bullying, cyberbullying, um, as well as the 24-hour news cycle have made schools feel less safe for this generation of students, according to research. Um, and for example, the Human Rights Campaign explains that 70% of LGBTQ youth report having been bullied at school because of their sexual orientation. And more than a third of teens in 2016 were affected by cyberbullying compared to 9% uh, in 2007. These challenges may follow Generation Z students into their college experiences. They may feel fear as they enter college or after news of another mass shooting incident in a school or a college in the US. These stresses that our students carry with them may affect their involvement and success in our classes. So we need to understand these potential issues and help our students thrive despite them. By contrast, students may also move on faster than we do after events like these. This may be due to the frequency with school and mass shootings have happened throughout their entire lives. Some other historical contexts that may have shaped Gen Z students, the Great Recession um, may shape their views on the economy and money. The Affordable Care Act may shape their views on health care. Um, our first black president, o Obama, may have shaped their views on diversity and inclusion, um, and the same with gay marriage that might have shaped their views on LGBTQ issues and inclusivity, um, and medical marijuana and recreational marijuana legalization may have shaped how they view the criminal justice system, health care, and recreational drug use as well. Regarding technology, Gen Z has always had access to web and social technology. The oldest were in elementary school when Facebook was conceived um, and when the first iPhone came out. And Generation Z has been inundated with nearly infinite amounts of information at their fingertips. And most of the oldest students had their own smartphone by the age of 12. 58% um, of 12 year olds in 2009 had a phone, as did 73% of 13 year olds. And for the youngest in Generation Z, 7% owned their own mobile device by the age of eight. And 59% had their own tablet by the same age. The average five to eight year old spent over an hour per day on mobile media devices in 2017 with children from lower income families actually spending more time on mobile devices than children from higher income families. 
Other technology that has shaped the, this generation includes internet and Wi-Fi ubiquity, um, iPhone and smartphones, social media inundation, um, Xbox and Wii came out while they were younger, Blu-ray media came out when they were younger, um, streaming media um, has become their normal, and also cloud saving and sharing. So what does this mean for our students? Um, the ubiquity of technology and the ease of searching for information online for Generation Z might influence their attitudes toward and approaches to learning. So for those in Gen Z, um, their approach to research might be less about acquiring new knowledge and more about accessing a quick answer to complete an assignment. Students might also mistakenly believe that technology has made them smarter not realizing that it's the technology that knows the answer is not them. And I actually had this conversation with students uh, about a year or two ago. Um, therefore, we need to help our traditional age students recognize the difference between accessing information and learning. And because of the overload of information available online, our students need to learn with our help how to navigate all of the information that's available to them, how to find quality and accurate information, how to identify misinformation, and how to even unlearn misinformation. Generation Z also has to contend with uh, potential attention span issues. Um, they might have inability to focus because of how pervasive technology has become in all of our lives, but particularly, particularly for Gen Z as they grew up with smartphones and that constant barrage of streaming media. Um, and in increased internet accessibility through Wi-Fi and smartphones has led to um, lowered attention spans, um, and more multitasking. So, for example, our students might be searching the internet for information while posting to social media, while watching TikTok videos, while trying to write an essay for our class. Um, but this so-called multitasking is um, an increased inability to focus. Um, so according to researchers. So we as educators need to continue to help students by encouraging them to be more focused, to be less distracted, um, by helping them create healthy study and work habits that don't involve this multitasking. So one way that I do this for my students, um, and this is all of my students, um, because we're all attached to our sm smartphones these days now, or at least a lot of us are, um, and so I have an extra credit assignment where every single day I put out sheets of paper and it's got all of my students' names on it. They put their cell phone on top of that, and if they keep it there the entire class period, then they get extra credit for that day. Um, so that's one way that I help all of us avoid the compulsion to look at our cell phones because we always look at them. Um, when we're not even thinking about it. Um, so Generation Z students may see themselves as savvy users of technology, but their perception of their effectiveness at using that technology for educational purposes might not entirely be accurate. Uh, so we shouldn't assume that because they've been using technology practically since they were born, that they know how to use it proficiently, effectively, or appropriately for learning in our college courses. So let's move on to um, the next generation, which is millennials. Um, the birth years for millennials, 1981 to 1996, according to Pew Research. Um, the youngest millennials who were college-age students have graduated from college, but we still have millennials younger and older in our classes. Millennials are now between the ages of 23 and 39. Um, some may have delayed college for a few years, worked while going to community college before transferring to NIU, or they may have skipped college 20 years ago and are returning students decades removed from their last school experiences. We may have gotten used to teaching millennials over the past two decades, um, which is good. Um, so we might be most comfortable with this generation of students, like they're, because they're the most recent cohort before our now traditional aged, um, oldest Gen Z students. So let's discuss some historical and technological technological context for millennial students. <clears throat> so in contrast to Gen Z students, the oldest millennials had little, if any, access to cell phones at 12 and 13 years old, which would have been 1993 to 1994. Um, compared with younger millennials, of which about 18% of 12-year-olds and 34% of 13-year-olds had a cell phone 10 years later in 2004. Older millennials also grew up still using library card catalogs and saw the first online library catalogs develop and become used more widely through the 1990s. They also conducted research using print sources throughout high school and into college. They were the first generation to encounter widespread use of the internet in an educational setting. They were also the first generation to be introduced to social media as we think of it today. Um, and in fact, the oldest millennials graduated from college before Facebook was developed for Harvard students in 2004. Um, and older millennials also grew up largely without cell phones and graduated from college a few years before the first iPhone was released in 2006. 
Um, some items of historical context for millennials include the Gulf War, which began when the youngest were in elementary school. Um, the eldest will probably remember watching the O.J. Simpson Bronco chase and trial in the mid-90s. Um, the Oklahoma City bombing is within memory of the older millennial group. Columbine happened when older millennials were graduating high school and the youngest were still toddlers. Um, the Clinton impeachment may have shaped middle and older millennials' political perspectives. Um, Older millennials will definitely remember hanging chads in the 2000 recount um, in the 2000 election. 9-11 uh, is not just history for millennials. They remember where they were when they heard the news, and many watched it unfold through television media as young adults um, and teenagers. Uh, the Iraq war was largely fought by middle and older millennials. Um, Obama won 60% of the millennial vote. Uh, the Great Recession has significantly affected their lives, including their ability to find careers, buy homes, get married, and start families, all of which are happening at later dates for millennials. Um, and student loans have become a heavy burden for millennials as well. Student loan advice for millennials in the 1990s and the early 2000s included encouragement to take out loans to pay for college because they would pay for themselves. And this advice didn't take into account the precipitous rise in college tuition and boarding costs that happened. As for technology, some of the experiences of millennials growing up with the technology, um, as I already mentioned, card catalogs, online catalogs um, for libraries started to become more and more popular through the 1990s. Um, they remember dumb phones or, or landline phones, um, as well as um, uh, cell phones that were not smartphones. Um, they might have used a payphone. Um, they remember diskettes. And USB flash drives didn't start becoming used until uh, 2000. Um, they remember pre and post internet. They uh, played Super NES and PlayStation. Um, they remember when DVDs came out. Yahoo Maps uh, was how you got around. Um, and internet social media inception with, uh, if you're a millennial, you probably remember Six Degrees from 1997. So that was a precursor to MySpace and Facebook. Let's talk about Generation X. Generation X was born between 1965 and 1980. Um, they're age 39 to 55. These students are either returning to college, they're starting college for the first time, they're trying to switch careers or earn promotions by earning a degree or further education. Um, they might be entering graduate school. Some may have started off in careers that are no longer viable or they may have children graduating from college and starting their own careers. And these Generation X students are now able to pursue their educational or career career goals that may have taken a backseat as they raise their families. Um, and as we know from our conversation, a lot of you are Generation X or identify with Generation X. So um, you'll be able to identify with um, this generation of students, <clears throat> which could be a good thing and it can also be a challenge. Generation X students have lived through some significant historical and technological events. Many new and continuing faculty may be Generation X and so they may have a lot in common with these students, but there might also be many differences due to different educational and life experiences. So whenever we teach students who are our own age, it may be difficult to navigate that dynamic, dynamic and balance teaching contemporaries alongside our younger students who may more naturally view us as authority figures. Our older students, including older millennials, Generation X, and baby boomers, which we'll discuss next, may come to our classrooms with different expectations, with different attitudes, and different educational needs than our traditional age college students. Um, but before we discuss that, let's take a look at some unique experiences of members of Generation X, which are up on the screen right now. Um, so some historical context, some major events that happened, 25th Amendment ratification, um, Watergate and Nixon reg reg resignation, Sandra Day O'Connor became the first female Supreme Court justice, um, the Challenger explosion happened, Iran-Contra and Exxon Valdez, uh, Berlin Wall came down, the Cold War ended, South African apartheid ended, um, and the Oklahoma City bombing happened as well. Um, and Generation X's experiences with technology include the VCR. Um, actually, younger, the youngest uh, in Generation X may remember the first retail barcode use, which happened in 1974. It was a pack of Wrigley's gum in Ohio, in case you were wondering. Um, mass market personal computers became available in 1977. CDs and the Sony Discman in the 80s. Um, the internet became publicly available in 1991, and eBay was, was launched in 1995. 
All right, the last generation we're going to be giving an overview of is baby boomers. <clears throat> um, they may be less likely to be in our classrooms, but we do still teach these students. Baby boomers are age 55 to 74. Some disciplines and degree programs might be more likely to have this generation in the classroom, um, just non-traditional students in general in the classroom. For example, business maybe ha might have more students who are earning further degrees to move up the corporate ladder um, or move into management positions or start their own businesses. Um, our baby boomer students may have different educational and technology needs than our younger students, but they're also definitely up to the challenge and they are eager to learn. Baby boomers have a wide range of historical um, Signif historically significant events. Um, they've lived through um, events like the Korean War, Vietnam, um, the Cuban Missile Crisis, Alaska and Hawaii becoming states, Brown versus the Board of Education, the assassinations of JFK and Martin Luther King Jr., the first man on the moon, um, and Watergate. So there's a wide range of experience here historically, but there are also some significant advances in technology that baby boomers experienced, which may have also shaped their perspectives on technological advancements today. So some technology that baby boomers grew up with include um, television mass production, which uh, was in the mid-1950s, um, orbital space flight, and the first man on the moon in the 60s, um, the invention of audio cassettes um, related to space flight, uh, Fortran programming became available in the 1950s, um, and the first non-car mo mobile phone, the Dynatac, in the 19, early 1970s, um, and actually the first car mobile phone, um, just for a piece of, of information, came out in the 1940s, 1946 actually, um, and it weighed, I believe, if I'm remembering correctly, 80 pounds, so that was pretty huge. Um, so let's talk about these multi-generational classrooms. So let's bring everybody together from all of these different generations. Now that we know a bit about some historical context and technology context throughout the past four generations, how do we leverage that knowledge into teaching classrooms in which students span those multiple generations? As a general rule, teaching best practices are best practices for teaching all students. The evidence-based practices that are touted as better for teaching Generation Z and Millennials before them and Gen X and Baby Boomers before them should be best practices for teaching all students, not just those from the current generation. So yes, there are some differences in the way that members of Generation Z have grown up, particularly related to the pervasiveness of technology, advanced technology in their and all of our lives currently. Um, but many of the challenges of teaching the current generation are variations of challenges that have always been present in teaching. Whereas today's students may look up information on the internet and regurgitate the first source they find on the subject, experienced that with my students. Um, previous generations may have reached for the nearest encyclopedia or textbook or library book on the subject and regurgitated information from that source in an assignment. The challenge in both instances is similar. How to teach students to conduct research in ways that are appropriate for college level work. There are new challenges in teaching, but they're not the fault of the newest generation. Rather, they're just the result of ever-evolving technology and a changing educational landscape, including changes in educational research and theory. Furthermore, generalizations about the members of any particular generation are not useful insofar as they criticize an entire group based on their age range, but they are useful in helping to understand the historical perspective from which members of a generation may be entering our learning environments. And that's why I gave us an overview of some of the historical context and technological context for each of those generations. Even so, there is still a lot of variety of perspectives and experiences within each generational division. And painting everybody with the same brush to draw conclusions about what an entire generation values, for example, isn't necessarily useful or accurate, and it might represent certain demographics, too. The purpose of the information I've shared with you today isn't to draw broad conclusions about members of a particular generation, but rather to present some universal realities many members of a generation have had to contend with and live through with a view that those realities may impact their learning and our teaching. 
So here are a few strategies for managing multi-generational classrooms. Um, first, leverage your lectures to allow time for activities, collaboration, and discussion. One way to gauge whether students are engaged with and learning the material you're trying to teach them is by having them apply it. So you could break up lectures into shorter chunks, add opportunities for active learning experiences that'll help students apply what they're learning, and also help you assess whether students are actually learning the material. And this can help in a multi-generational classroom in particular because students who may not have been in a classroom for a decade or two or three might want those opportunities to test their knowledge. Um, and you may need the opportunity to make sure that all students are learning and that your pacing is appropriate for all learners. Another related way to manage a multi-generational classroom is to use a variety of teaching methods. This is a best practice for teaching generally, but it also helps in a multi-generational learning environment because it helps reinforce learning for students. Multimodal learning, which is teaching the same material in multiple different ways, has been proven to enhance learning and help students retain information and apply that information. The last three methods for managing multi-generational classrooms are connected in that they focus on making learning meaningful and respecting students' prior knowledge and experiences. So first, acknowledge the differences between students from different generations and accept those differences. Realize that some students may interact with you differently based on their age in relation to yours or their extensive professional experience or their discomfort with being of a different age than their classmates. Help students over overcome those challenges and learn how to navigate the college experience. So in other words, meet them where they're at and get them where they need to be. Second, connect course concepts to the real world. Returning students may want to know how what they're learning is meaningful for their educational and professional goals, and younger students increasingly want their education to be meaningful and directly connected to prospective careers. So ask yourself, how can I make learning meaningful for my students? This may involve coming up with a case study, for example, that relates to a real world, real world problem or connecting a class session's topic to current. Um, there are many possibilities for meaning making in the classroom, and there's no subject that can't be connected to students' lives. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, leverage the differences in experience and knowledge of your students to enhance learning. Does your Gen X student have pertinent experience from which his or her classmates could benefit? How could you help them share that experience to improve the learning and understanding of their classmates? Find out what your students know and what their experiences are and use it. This will help older students make meaning of course concepts and it's gonna help younger students connect with their older classmates and learn from them. So since we've discussed teaching in the multi-generational classroom, we should also cover technology and what our expectations should be in regard to our students' proficiency. Although our Gen Z students may have grown up with technology, and I mentioned this, and they might be comfortable using apps on a smartphone, we shouldn't make assumptions that there are other generations of students' abilities with technology. So we shouldn't assume that older students can't use technology well, or that they cannot or are unwilling to learn to use technology, especially if older students are in the workforce. They've been using some forms of technology um, uh, for for years. So similarly, we shouldn't assume that younger students can use technology well or effectively for learning. They may have a lot of experience navigating apps using smartphones, tablets, and Chromebooks, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they know how to use technology appropriately, effectively in a college-level educational environment. They may be able to search Google, but can they use an advanced search to find educational or government resources? Can they explain why a source is or isn't credible? To make students more comfortable with using educational technology and to teach them to use it appropriately, we should use a variety of technologies in the classroom and encourage students to do so as well. So in fact, we want to teach students how to use instructional technologies um, or technologies that we're using in the classroom, even if it's not technically an instructional technology. Um, have students conduct research online, for example, and give them a rubric that outlines what a credible source looks like so they can try to find appropriate sources using their own methods. Then, you know, they tend to become frustrated with that, trying to find credible sources in that way. Then we can use that as a learning opportunity to teach them how to use technology more effectively and efficiently to find credible sources. Um, and then finally, we want to encourage students to share their expertise with technology. What can they already do? Uh, before making assumptions, find out what they know. Maybe we can from our students, too. Maybe they know something that we don't know. Um, and also, we want to encourage students to share their gaps in knowledge so that we can help fill those gaps and maybe help their classmates fill those gaps as well. So I just want to take um, 
a minute to for a couple of discussion questions, but before we do, um, I just want to open it up to if whether anybody has any questions at this point. And if you do, you can type it into the chat box there. I'll just take a minute to pause and wait. And if nobody has a question, then I will move on to our discussion. It doesn't seem like anybody is typing, so I will move on. So I just want to ask you a question about how your generational experience influences your teaching style. So that is your experience as a supposed member of a generation or with a generation that you identify with. Um, how does that influence your teaching style or does it? Got some people typing. Okay, so we say, um, someone says that the being a cusper helps uh, to relate to multiple different groups. And then someone else is saying that um, they don't know if their generational experience influenced their teaching, but their cultural and world experiences definitely impact their teaching. Um, we have someone who's a millennial who uses terms to promote acceptance and avoid stereotypes in politically incorrect terms. Um, as a Gen Xer, Shane says, um, I have to make more of an effort to understand use of social technology and to find ways to use tech more in class to access reliable information related to the topic. Um, Andrea is sharing a resource, um, a fun and interesting discussion tool with students, the mindsetlist.com slash lists. Jamie agrees with Melissa. Style is very similar. Um, so the millennialness. Does anybody else want to share? Oh, Andrea is giving some more information about that tool. Um, it was developed by Beloit College to help faculty address issues like those that we've discussed here. So that'd be a great tool. Thank you for sharing, Andrea. All right, so let's move on since we're running a little bit low on time. Um, let's move on to talking about generational differences in the classroom um, and another set of uh, questions here that I have for you. What have been your challenges teaching multi-generational classes and how did your approach to teaching change or did it when you started getting more students from different generations in your class as opposed to more traditional age students? So in other words, what have you found useful in teaching multi-generational classes that you think the rest of the participants might benefit from? Got a couple people typing. Okay, great. So um, we have one participant who says that when they have students who are 20s and 60s together, they try to make a mixture of generational groups for case study to give them a chance to understand each other. Great. Um, another says video tutorials, how to check email, access Blackboard. Those videos help everyone. Um, uh, feeling of awkwardness in those who are older or the same age. Um, but trying to encourage students, especially older students, to share knowledge with the class and me since she's always learning too. Great. Just wait a few more seconds in case anybody else wants to share. All 
great. So, uh, oh, uh, Mindy says when I use web conferencing or apps specifically for virtual dissection, some of the older students have a hard time catching on. Okay. Has there been a way that you've tried to address that issue or are you looking for ideas for that? The younger ones explain it. Great, leveraging experience uh, of everybody in the classroom to help their classmates. That's excellent. All right, we'll wait just a couple more seconds. Andrea says that she finds younger students are really quite helpful and like helping the older students. And I'm sure the, the feeling is mutual too. Um, goes against that stereotype, yes, definitely. Okay, so I just wanna leave you with a couple of uh, questions just to think about for your discipline and your teaching. We won't answer these questions here because we are running a little bit low on time, but I just want you to have some food for thought. So how does your course or your courses relate to the real world? How can you make learning meaningful for all students in your classes? Um, and that's students of all generations. So think about that as we conclude here today. Um, just as a summary, generational generality shouldn't be used to criticize or dismiss students. Um, knowing historical and technological context in relation to students' experiences might help us understand where students are coming from, but we shouldn't be using it to scapegoat students or stereotype students. Um, and we can leverage our students' differences and experiences, as we've seen here, younger students helping older students, older students helping younger students to enhance learning and create meaningful learning experiences for all students. So if you have any questions, you can contact me or faculty development, and we'd be happy to help. Um, I'm at amanda.smothers at niu.edu. You can also connect with FACDEV and see what we're up to um, at our Twitter account at FACDEV or facebook.com slash FACDEV, too, um, and get some updates and uh, some resource sharing there as well. Um, if anybody has any questions with the end of our session here, just uh, type them into the chat box. Um, I'm going to answer that. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks, Bill. Thank you all. Thank you. And like I said, if you have any questions or need any resources, just let me know, send me an email, um, and I will help out. Thank you all.